Change is difficult and not everyone agrees with what kind of change is needed, which complicates mm -hmm. things even further. Like the, the four of us on this call may, you know, we, we probably look at the world in a very similar way. And there are people out there that think the complete opposite of us that, you know, may, might believe that, you know, people can't be trusted to make, to make their own decisions that a large government is needed, you know, to coerce people into making the decisions that, you know, they wish that people would make, you know, I, I'm the exact opposite of that. I think that the, you know, the, the most power should be devolved to the, to the lowest form of government, which would be the individual. You're listening to the Ottawa Real Estate Podcast with your hosts, Paul Stevenson, David Warren, and Greg Campbell. Let's see what's going on in the world of real estate today. Hello, and welcome back. This is the Ottawa Real Estate Podcast, where we talk about real estate, mortgages, whatever else we feel like talking about that week. My name is Paul Stevenson. I'm a mortgage agent, level two. You can check me out at paulstevenson.ca. I'm joined, as always, by my esteemed co-hosts, David Warren, owner and mortgage agent at Referral Mortgages, and uh, Greg Campbell, realtor extraordinaire at the Campbell Merrick Group. And gentlemen, how are we doing today? We're back. Great. Great day. Great sunny day in the nation's capital. Just, just swell. Just swell. <laughs> I, met a, I met an agent at a, an agent open house last week. Mm. Walked up to me. Andrew, Andrew Herman, I believe was his name. Walked up to me and he says, hey, bro. He's like, do you delve? How's the delving? <laughs> I, we delve amazing. into this I obviously <laughs> laughed hysterically and I'm like, oh, so you're a fan of the show. He's like, yeah, I watch it all the time. It's pretty funny. Yeah. That's for anyone great. listening last week, we, we realized that AI uses the word delve in almost every construction of an article that it writes. So if you see the word delve in any article, very likely written by AI. Or uh, AI we, we involved. Get, or AI, AI involved. AI involved. Yeah. We're, we're going to get uh, Do You Delve t-shirts and sweaters, and uh, we will have it available as merch in the, in the, coming, in the coming weeks. Also, yeah. we should announce, we're going to do, now it's not finalized yet, but we're at the tail end of finalizing this. December 18th, which is a Monday, we're going to do our kind of final show of the year, and we're going to do it live. We're going to rent out probably the Breather Studio or kind of a co-working space for a couple hours, mm -hmm. and it's going to be a live show drop-ins so if there's any other realtors mortgage agents counselors you know a little preview uh, anyone who wants to stop by have a chat you know we're going to be live on air and we're going to be uh, chatting maybe having a couple holiday cocktails yeah it's basically going to be a party Monday morning it'll be a deep delve cocktail. it'll be a deep delve delve deep live year. delve four hours live streaming tow rep <laughs> just forever starts yeah, off so classy, lawyers up mortgage show. brokers realtors Everyone who's ever listened to the show will be home on. inspectors. <laughs> so we'll give you some more deets as we get uh, closer to the day, but that's kind of the plan. That's about a month away. So we're wrapping up November, gentlemen. What are we seeing in the market? How are, how are things shaking up, Greg? I've got some good stats here that people will hate, but you know, maybe love at the same time. So in Canada overall, this is a Canadian, Canadian tip. In Canada, sales were up 0.9% overall pushing sales to 33,921 homes sold in, this is in October, but that number doesn't compete with the 16% rise of new listings with over 70,000 properties listed for sale. Now, I think that that number is going to be much higher for November in terms of listings to market and the sales I think will be down. There's only been four Octobers in the past three decades that have seen this, that have seen this many listings. So I think November, it'll be in the last four decades. That's my prediction. We'll know that in a couple of weeks in December. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the only stat that I have for you this week. Because I knew we had Matt on and that was, Matt's more important than our stats. I do have some other information. I have a quick comment. Uh, I thought this was very uh, interesting. I was reading this this morning. Our, uh, you know, one of our favorite people, Christian Freeland, announced a uh, $1.2 billion um, dollar investment in housing in Toronto with a significant portion going to an 855-unit project on Front Street owned by Tricon Capital. Now, I didn't know this, but Tricon Capital is a company based, they're in Toronto, offices in the States as well. 
they buy up properties constantly. Mm -hmm. So did they need the money from the government? The answer that everyone is saying is absolutely they did not need the money from the government. But the government, of course, wants to make it look like they're doing something to contribute. So they're donating this money. There's a little bit of information about it where many people are disagreeing that this is going into it. And we don't even know, you know, if that money will see it and if that will help turn this into affordable housing of some kind or not. But this is what happen is happening. So Tricon's coming in and just buying up properties like crazy in uh, Canada now based on the idea that no one wants to uh, buy a home and everyone wants to rent. Yeah, like they'll only stay vacant for so long, right? So like as they build properties and as properties are are sitting, like someone is going to scoop those up yep. when they hit, you know, as low as they can possibly get. And then if it is someone who isn't living there, as you said, Greg, it's only going to extrapolate and, and accelerate rent costs and, and other costs of living that are outside yep. of that. And that's to what it says. Like about that from, from the spending of the government money, like in a democratic society, as I'm sure Matt, Matt will, uh, will explain to us. We, no matter what you do, 50% of people are going to be upset, right? So like, you're never exactly. going to, you're never going to make yeah. everyone happy. The goal is to just at least try to get as close to the middle as possible so that everyone's upset. You know, <laughs> you want <laughs> everyone to be mildly upset, <laughs> but not, but not, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It says, you know, the, the PBO, the, uh, parliamentary budget officer, uh, warns that the funds provided by the government are often directed to projects already underway, making them more profitable and providing more leverage, ultimately concentrating the housing industry. Mm -hmm. um, despite warnings, the article suggests that the government may prioritize the appearance of taking action over addressing the potential negative impacts of excessive spending on housing projects. Very interesting. That is very interesting. Yeah. So yeah. more on Tricon. I'm going to investigate Tricon a bit more and see how much information I can get because it seems like you know, like a Vanguard kind of thing, BlackRock or whatever, just buying, buying, buying huh. in Canada. Anyways, that's right. it for me. See you next that's week. for the show, yeah. That's it, we're done. <laughs> yeah, well, I say, you know, before we get too further, I, I think we should touch further on that, Greg, but uh, we do have a, an esteemed guest with us today. Yes. And we should bring Matt in so that we can, uh, we can introduce him and he can tell us all about what's happening in the east end of Ottawa. So we are joined uh, again. I think this might be Matt's third or fourth time joining us. We're always happy to have him here. It's Matt Luloff, City Councillor for Orleans East and Cumberland. Matt Luloff, welcome. How's it welcome. going, guys? It's really good to be back. I, I, love, I love chatting with you guys. And, and it was this morning, it was a bit touch and go because I had to drop my daughter off to school and get back here. But then I realized that, you know, Dave and Paul know where I live because you are my mortgage brokers. So you know mm -hmm. that it was only going to take me about 10 minutes. So I wasn't <laughs> too worried about it, but it's really, really glad. I'm, I'm really, really glad to, to be back with you guys. I think this is, I think this is number, number three, but it's I think always it a is. Yeah. It's almost like once a year. It's once it a is. year. On the, I'll do, yeah. I'll do my yearly since we launched. Yeah, we've been doing this for too long and not <laughs> no, long enough. Three years at the same now. time. I think it's three yes. years in October. So, Matt, I think the last time you were on, we talked specifically about you know in Orleans, you were looking at or considering like the 15 minute commute and kind of 15 minute communities and so on. We've seen light rail obviously have massive advancements since we last spoke. I think they were just starting like the Montreal Road like a station yeah. when you're on last. So obviously a lot has been done. So very broadly we can dig into some deeper things but like what's new in orleans as far as like the real estate front and what what sort of changes are you seeing there yeah for sure so we've we, we finished the orleans secondary plan the economic corridor study that i think that we we went into pretty pretty decent depth last time and we updated our community improvement plan so you know i believe that that secondary plans and and community improvement plans should kind of work hand in hand so you've got your your carrot and your stick right so your stick is like permissibility. It's it's a secondary plan being a part of the official plan, doing designations as to like, you know, what the city wants to see for growth in an area, whether that's infill or, or greenfield. And then the CIP provides a tax incentive to achieve that, right? And so, you know, what, what a CIP does is, you know, you improve your property based on a list of criteria that the city's looking at. So let's say you've got a, you know, like the old, I don't, I don't want to pick out, like pick on a, a you know, a, a specific business, but, you know, think of like the old, like Masconi's or whatever, which is now like a tire changers on, on, on St. Joseph Boulevard, right? It's at the back of the property. There's a lot of, a lot of concrete and, mm -hmm. and asphalt in front. And so what the city's looking to do is to have businesses, you know, move to the, to the street front, build some housing above it. 
uh, you know, like you see on a, on a traditional main street. And so, you know, if you check all these boxes, you get it approved. And then what the city will do is actually grant you back a portion of the differential in, in your property taxes. So let's say, you know, your property taxes were, you know, say a hundred thousand dollars a year, which is a bit, bit outrageous, I, I would say, but, <laughs> and now, now you're, or you're, you're assessed at a hundred thousand dollars a year, and now you're assessed at a million dollars. Um, so what, what they'll do is they'll essentially grant you back, uh, a little, a little more to start and then less over time, just to make it so that you can reinvest in your business uh, and give you an incentive to, uh, to do that work. The tax uplift is always there. So the city always makes more and you get some of that back. And it's almost like a, you know, thank you for improving your business and, 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 and contributing to the economy. Now, unfortunately the, the new mayor, when he came in, you know, promised during the election to look at this, because obviously some businesses that maybe slightly controversial, you know, end up able to access this. And, you know, I, th I think that probably the best example of that was during the last term in the Montreal Road CIP, a Porsche dealership was able to access this. Mm. Now it's not necessarily, a, yes, that, that's what the land is used for. It's a, it's a, a local company that, that owns this, this franchise. And in, in my opinion, you know, any, any sort of tax uh, uplift, and, and street beautification is good. However, it was pretty controversial. And so they wanted to take a look at that program. Now, unfortunately, you know, I think they've taken a one size fits all solution uh, to this issue. I think that Orlean, the reason why the Orleans CIP has been particularly generous in the past is because we haven't seen the same sort of economic development in the East end as we've seen in the South and the West. And so I'm, I'm a bit disappointed with, with what they've come back with, but you know, we can, we can get into that later when we talk about, you know what, what the city can be doing to ensuring that we're to, to, to ensure that we are meeting our housing goals. But, you know, so that, that's a little bit disappointing, although I'm, I'm pleased that, that we, that we now have our secondary plan in place. So what's, what's coming up. So we've had quite a few uh, applications come in, some of them slightly more controversial than others. One of them being uh, the redevelopment of the Orleans uh, YM, y, uh, YWCA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Big loss to our community to lose that space. And, you know, I, I fought really hard to get Merrick Palmer and, and the Capitol Courts Academy into that, into that gym space. We don't have a whole lot of gym space that's not in schools in the East End. Like, you know, think of like your local gyms, you know, your, lo your local you know, gym, uh, gyms like, like Francois Dupuis has a, has a basketball court, but mm -hmm. the other two in Orleans don't. Yeah, I mean, growing uh, and, up. Growing up playing sports, you're always playing at, uh, you know, Luriel oh. or one of these high schools, right? That's where you're. Even, yeah, your out of school sports are always at high schools. For sure. And I mean, with the, with the pandemic, there was less access to those schools. So having, you know, these public spaces is, mm. is really important. So, you know, I bemoan the loss of that space once they do redevelop, but it will be good to have more density near, near transit. Mm. So they're looking at, you know, a couple of, a couple of quite tall towers are going to require an official plan amendment and a secondary plan amendment to get the heights that they're, that they're looking for. At the corner of Centrum, so just down the street, Centrum and Place d'Orleans Boulevard, mm -hmm. Group Maurice is coming in with two towers and a podium of, of independent seniors living. So that's good. People want to be able to age in the community that they, you know, that, that they grew up in and the community that they raised their kids in. You know, I did Meals on Wheels a couple of uh, winters ago and, and met with a, a lovely, a lovely elderly lady. Her husband had passed away. Her kids had moved out. She was living in a five bedroom home in Fallingbrook. And I asked her, mm -hmm. you know, like, this must be really difficult to keep up. You know, why not move on? And, you know, so a younger family can, uh, can move into the neighborhood. And she said, well, Matt, like there's, there's no rentals. Uh -huh. uh, there's no rentals in Orleans. So, you know, I'd love to sell my home and you know, I've, I've built up this next nest egg, but I can't, I can't stay in, in my community and I don't want to move mm -hmm. to the West. So, you know, that's good. I'm glad that that's, that that's moving along. Another interesting project is one that's being proposed, you know, uh, kind of just, just on the, uh, at the mouth entering, going down into, uh, onto Petrie Island before the causeway. The proposal is, uh, is three, uh, three larger towers. So within walking distance of the new trim station, which will be great. Uh, although we do need to get some money for a pedestrian bridge there, um, having people crossing at grade over a four lane highway. Not exactly ideal, um, especially if you're bringing your kids down to, to go swimming. This is, this is something I've been chipping away at and something I've been very frustrated with, frankly, um, because the federal funding certainly that was offered certainly wasn't enough uh, to, to, you know, to, to help us in any meaningful way. 
but that they're they're looking there and if they can get the city to to work with them on on transferring or or being able to buy a, a chunk of land that's that's in a right of way that can you know actually meet the secondary plan goals build some public realm there they're looking at you know the possibility of a spa the plans also show an amphitheater like a a, a, a privately owned public space for an amphitheater so we can Amazing. have concerts you know, maybe organized crime can have a, or, you know, could have a, we could have a, a reunion <laughs> I'm there, you know, that would be kind of cool. I'd play, I'd open for you acoustic if you wanted. <laughs> so, um, so many people show, watching have be... no idea what's happening right now, what that means, but I love it that you brought <laughs> it up. Organized <laughs> rhyme and hearts of minds. That's the, yeah, that's yeah, there the we go. I'd get so, back together with yeah. them. Uh, if you do, yeah. um, you know, this, this sort of idea of having the developer build this, this, this public realm, I think saves the city a lot of money and adds a lot to the site. Yes. So when somebody's looking to do that, you know, the city needs to work with them and not say, okay, well, you know, this, this piece of property is worth, you know, a half a million dollars. And it's like, okay, well, to, 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 to who, if I'm the only person that can develop yes. it, you're not going to be able to put a row of townhomes there. So like, why don't I convey a piece of my property to you? You can, and, and then we kind of work this out, but no real property tends to fight with with somebody who's looking to achieve their own goals i i and this will be the theme of you know what we'll chat about today is that the city tends to work across purposes constantly you have a stated policy goal and then you have the actual policy that comes forward and it works across purposes and it makes housing more expensive and less accessible uh, to more people which is which is a, a huge problem um and, and matt with everything that you're working on and, and obviously you know like you alluded to it can be kind of a tough slug a little bit of times across departments or, you know, within the council itself of what, you know, what's stated as being the official plan, but then people have differing opinions of even what that should be. What are you seeing as far as in your area of, of Orleans coming of that's worked really well over the last year? And then also what hasn't worked well? And what do you feel like you need that that's lacking, whether it be for the community, whether it be for housing, whether it be, you know, just in general, just, you know, kind of for, for your, for your district, if you will. Yeah, that's fair. I think that, I think that what the policies that we're working in our favor are the ones that are now being revisited, which, which is a problem for the East end. So like what's, what's working uh, really well, uh, the CIP was working really well for, you know, we, we met, we got one, one application, Although it didn't include include any housing, it was within an area that was that was that wasn't zoned for housing and prohibited housing. It's within, you know, a, a light industrial area along Trim Road. There was an application to the CIP that created more than than seventy five jobs. You know, it's it's wonderful to say that we need to build more housing, which we do, frankly, uh, but people need jobs to be able to pay for that housing as well. So you know, cutting out industrial projects or cutting out uh, simple simple employment projects is a bad idea. Cutting that out of a CIP is a bad idea. You got to have something for both, right? What else has worked worked really well? We, you know, we've been using another kind of controversial tool that, that's provided to the city via via the province's cash, cash in lieu of parkland. So rather than a parkland dedication in, in, a, de in a development, they can pay the city. We call that bribing the city. Yeah, basically, it's like, you know, yeah. over, overlook the fact that I'm not building a park here and we'll give you, <laughs> we'll give you money. But the good thing about that is, is that 50% essentially of that, of that amount basically becomes discretionary or semi-discretionary spending for the counselor. So I've been able to update parks that, you know, are not in, 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 in growth, in areas that are not high growth. So areas that'll be ripe for, for infill development later on down the line, but aren't quite there yet. So that's been really wonderful. And I've been, you know, been able to, you know, add a lot of amenities to, to parks, you know, what's not working very well in the East end right now is that we are, we are a high growth area in our South, um, and we're not meeting our infrastructure needs. So, mm. you know, and, and, you know, LRT construction has, has played a, a role in that and made it more difficult for people to get around. And then last summer, at one point in time, we had, you know, the NCC closing down the Sir George H. N. Parkway. Uh, we had parts of St. Joseph Boulevard being redone, reduced to one lane. Mm -hmm. We had large swaths of Innes Road reduced to one lane because of construction. And we had the 174 reduced to one lane because of construction. 
So if you're not like a real lucky government worker that can work from home most days, like how do we get in and out of our community, right? We need to be able to do road maintenance without having to worry about people not having an option to get in and out of the community. And on top of that, all of our growth is to the South. So we're, you know, kind of bought, we're becoming quite bottom heavy in Orleans. So how do people from the South get downtown? So right now they basically drive all the way North through neighborhoods on, on major collectors like Jean d'Arc or Orleans Boulevard or 10th line or trim. And they all crowd onto the 174 and mm -hmm. then you get to this, and then you get to the split. Right. And good luck at that point. If people were already on the one, so uh, on the 417 before the split, the people from the South, so you split, you split that in half, split those, that those cohorts in half. So people living in the South of Orleans, being able to access from a more Southern point and the people in North of Orleans being coming on in the split, you mm -hmm. split, you, you, you cut that traffic in half. So what we desperately need is to connect Brian Coburn Boulevard with the 417. Yes. Oh. Preferably at Hunt Club. Because then you're, the, now you're the starting to build the there, Anderson? Is that the closest one to Orleans? Heading down the... Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I mean... Or what's before uh, Anderson? I don't even know what's... Wa like on your way to La Mouge and all that. You could get off at... Wa like, you could, you could take all the back roads, you know, Anderson Road. You could take all the back roads, Ridge Road, and then kind of mm -hmm. cut on to Walkley. You know, you go down that hill... Yeah. through the NCC. I that's my that. that's my route depending on what day and what time it is. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> but it would it would it would make a yeah, heck of a lot some more company sense. now, gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, well. It's like the worst the best, secrets out. <laughs> worst best kept secret. But I mean like you don't, you shouldn't have to dipsy doodle like that to get on the on the 417. Mm -hmm. And the single biggest barrier that we've had to making this happen is the National Capital Commission, is the NCC. Not the city of Ottawa has offered them like hectares of land to swap. That's their, that's their role is to, you know, protect green space and whatnot. There's a hydro corridor there already that can be, that can be, you know, conveyed to the city for us to build this and we can do it in an ecologically responsible way. And in fact, the, the previous president of the, of friends of the mayor Bleu liked the route as well. It doesn't, everyone likes to say, well, it's going to, you're going to put a highway through the bog. That's so disingenuous. That is not what we're looking to do whatsoever. And also you get less idling. So it's better for the environment anyway, if people are able to, to get mm -hmm. straight on the highway. Plus we're looking at making it a bus rapid transit corridor, a BRT. So we'd yeah. be encouraging people from the South to take public transit because right now, what are they going to have to do? They're going to have to jump on a bus that takes them all the way down to the 174, get off there, transfer, get on the new train and, and head downtown where you could cut that off at the pass hop on the brt get dropped off at blair you're on the train and you're downtown you know yeah and it's funny that they have that that bus oh my god the park and ride park and uh, at ride. Uh, brian coburn and uh navin road and it's like no one uses it no buses come there it's just like this empty parking lot it's ridiculous and it's built for exactly what you're talking about yep you know i don't think i've ever seen used, a car in that parking and lot. that neighborhood's developing like crazy it's it's oh, so man. prime for this whole brian coburn route downtown you know, we're desperate for it. Yeah. And, you know, oh, go ahead, Dave. I was going to say, is there, and is there any movement with the NCC? Like, is there anything that you think will actually be able to happen or are they feet in their sand? Like they usually are feet in their, like feet in the sand. Like they usually are. I think that at this point in time, the only, you know, it, it would take someone, you know, in, in previous governments, there was usually, you know, a minister or, you know, I, I, you know, high ranking member of the government that would act as like an interlocutor between the NCC and the city of Ottawa. Uh, previously, that was John Baird, you know, as kind of like the regional minister. And he was able to just get the people to the table and say, look, guys, like, let's work this out. Let's, let's figure out how we're going to make this done. You know, you'll have to take some water in your wine. You'll have to take some water in your wine, but Let's let's do what's right for the national capital region rather than, you know, being very territorial about things. You know, I personally, like this might be controversial to say, but I don't think that's, that the National Capital Commission should be man managing roadways whatsoever. Oh. Um, same thing with the Queen Elizabeth Drive, right? Like if people were actually able to get the lands down, it would be far more successful than it is. But when you block off the only way to get there other than Bank Street, yeah. where it's buses and cars and pedestrians and bikes 
in cars. one lane. Yeah, one way trying to get everywhere. in there, right? Yeah, you I, know, if I, we could I love that questionnaire that they sent out. I, I filled it out online. They sent out a questionnaire of how often the, they're debating whether to leave it shut down for 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 active use when there's a brand new ninety million dollar bridge and and newly designed or and newly constructed pathways along that same road. And I filled it out and I was just like, this is like, my answers were like, I would use this 10 to 12 times a week, but I can't. So I'm stuck zigzagging or using bank and residential roads. And it just mm -hmm. makes no sense. Like I was like, why, why did you spend all this money on the pathways right beside it Who to then close the, to close the road as well? Like, I don't know. I thought that was, uh, I think that's the most like ludicrous idea that they've, they've had. Adding insult to injury, 30% delays for first responders mm -hmm. in the Glebe because of it. 30% delay. Wow. Yeah. Our fire department, because there's, there's, there's a fire uh, station right there, you know, near, near the, the canal Ritz. Mm -hmm. And so, you mm -hmm. know, you got to, they've got a dipsy doodle through, you know, they've got a, and, and even if they do decide to take the QED when it's closed, you know, it's, that's dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. So. Anyway, it's, it's quite frustrating. Right. And so, you know, that's, that's one of the single biggest impediments that we have. And then the NCC, you know, makes it even worse by, by reopening along with minister Mona Forche or ex minister Mona Forche starts opening up the debate about, you know, a new interprovincial crossing, you know, to the East end, which is also outrageous because all you're going to do is make it worse on the 174. So you're going to put, now you're going to put Quebec traffic on right. a municipal infrastructure, by the way, the city owns the 174 it was downloaded during the mike mike harris era you're going to dump interprovincial traffic onto the 174 before the split like give your head yeah. <laughs> dude that's you know? it. it's insane it's insane and then you know what happens because where's that bridge going to be closer to rockland right i mean well they can't interfere with the ferry but i mean that's that's just insane it's without not a good idea like trucks need to be able to get to the juncture of the, like the, the 416 and the 417, right? No, like that's, that's a better spot to start looking is in yeah. the West end, right? Otherwise you're just jamming truck traffic into the East end and clogging up the 417 for much longer. I think that, you know, proper serious study, not this piecemeal nonsense that the federal government's done over the years needs to be completed. And we need to have a realistic view of how we're going to manage truck traffic through the downtown core. Cause I admit it is a problem. Anybody who's downtown on King Edward or, you know, making yes. their way into the market, it's a problem. So I knew someone who was involved with that initial planning that never happened and he quit because it didn't happen. And his comments to me were just like, you have no idea how long I've been working on this. I've been working on this for years and the people involved are just horrible at getting anything done. And when it didn't happen, he just, he quit. He retired. And the longer, the longer you wait, <laughs> the more that it costs. Yeah, exactly. In the end. Like and all that money was wasted. Just, just talking about it and no, with no result. It's terrible. Matt, with the, with the, pretty much the sole purpose of, organized government being like education healthcare, and infrastructure development right like this is literally their job is to find solutions to these problems and it seems like there's more problems and solutions yes. always like what is the bureaucratic roadblock that stops us from actually getting results is it money is it opinions is it like who's making the ultimate decision there is it a group of people is it one person like what's happening when it how comes do we to fix this when it comes to the NCC specifically, you know, it's the biggest issue is that the people that rep that, that are, that are representatives in the NCC, many of them are not from the national capital region, uh -huh. you know, because it's a, you know, they're, they're trying to make it the national capital region apparently belongs to all of Canada, which, you know, is, that's fine. I understand there are lots of federal properties here that are historic and, and national in nature, you know, but I mean, honestly, is like the Sir Georgia Chen Parkway, like, do you think somebody in Calgary cares about the Sir George Gen Parkway or the Aviation Parkway, you know, or, you know, the park, the, the road infrastructure along the canal? No, they care about the canal, you know, and they care about the green space. But the people that sit on that board are not elected on any merit. They're government appointees. Interesting. Uh, and frankly, I think that they feel entitled to, to act as if they are representative 
of Canadians, you know, like somebody from Calgary or from Vancouver, you know, Hey, you know, you're, I think that goes to their head that, you know, you now you're responsible for, for managing these assets in the national capital region. You know, they automatically think that they're, you know, some, some great Canadian and they can make decisions that, you know, that, that, you know, spites the, the city of Ottawa and, and, you know, they assert their jurisdiction. I th- honestly, I think it's a, it's a, juris- it's a, it's a jurisdictional rub uh, and one that makes things very difficult. You see, you see this play out when it comes to QED and the mayor standing there in the middle of the QED during rush hour, filming a two and a half minute video saying, you know, this should not be closed down. Not one bike or pedestrian interacts uh-huh. with them whatsoever during that two and two and a half minutes standing there uh-huh. talking, not one. So it's not like the, and then you look at the numbers that we take because we monitor the traffic on it. And then you look at the numbers that the NCC takes uh, and, and they're completely different. They tell a completely different story. On top of that, you know, I, and, and frankly, you know, to be fair to them, I think they're set up to fail in that, in that manner because they're not elected, because they're all uh, appointees. Um, and because, you know, I find that it, that it reflects the government of the day. So it becomes more ideological than it needs to. Um, and the, and the board hires, you know, their, their executive director right now, who's is Toby Nussbaum, who used to be a city councilor in the city of Ottawa, who obviously has their own ideological bent or their bones to pick w- with the city of Ottawa. I don't think, I don't think that that, that works, that model, this model works anymore. You know, mm. um, we're not trying to achieve the gray bear plan anymore. You know, you know, the NCC did a really good job redoing that, that boathouse along the canal. It's just too bad that only people from Rockcliffe can access it. You know, we tried to go there for lunch the the day of the army run. Well, first of all, you know, there's, 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 there's the army run. So there's no, no parking anywhere downtown, but you know, even if you wanted to take public transit to get there, it's almost impossible. If you want to go with your kids or, and, and whatnot, you have to, you know, find a place to, to cross over. There's no way to drive there. So basically it's a great, it's a nice little lake pool for the, you know, you know, terribly, terribly underprivileged people that live in Rockcliffe Park, you know, um, I just feel so bad for them that they don't have any property or any ability to have their own pool, you know, anyway, <laughs> at, at public expense, by the way, you know, and then they do things like, you know, spend $8 million on a, on a barn, you know, or storage shed mm. on mm. the property of, of, uh, of Rideau Hall. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of waste. And I think that, you know, it could be a heck of a lot more efficient. You also have your permanent bureaucracy that exists both at the city and, uh, and, um, at the federal government that really frames the debate about things. You know, it's the bureaucracy that comes to you with you, here are your options. And it's like, okay, well, what about this option? Well, we didn't look at that option. So here's, here's the options that are, that are in front of you. And a lot of times it's that, it's that bureaucracy or that, you know, mm. that permanent government that kind of steers steers the ship, which I, which I find frustrating. Um, Matt, how many, how many people do you think are out there that are like you that really want this to change? I and think what's, it of, gonna, what's it going to take to make that happen? I think a lot of people like, like intuit it, right? I think a lot of people out there right now are intuiting that things just aren't working. They're not mm. working the way that they should, you know, and they can point at me and they can say that, you know, Oh, you're a part of the problem because you know you and, and they'll pick whatever their their pet their pet issue of the day is that costs money and say like, oh you voted you know in favor of the revitalization of Lansdowne or Lansdowne 2.0 you know and then you know so I look at that and I say like okay well I mean we're, we're comparing you know apples to grapefruits here we own that asset you know at Lansdowne we're building more housing through the discussion down there and we can't attract any major events there because during the curling, I think it was like Scotty's that, that came, that came during the curling championships, they had to have volunteers up in the ceiling, squeegeeing water away from the holes. The press box is condemned, condemned. All of the suites are condemned. So people say, well, this is not end of life. Like you've got areas in your building that are condemned. You're end of life. Like, give me a break. Like, can you slap a coat of paint on? Sure. But can you make the bathrooms accessible for a reasonable cost? No. Can you expand the kitchen so that it can actually cater? No. So, you know, I, I kind of scoff at that a little bit. You know, what what can be done? Like, it, it, it will be difficult. Anything that's worthwhile in this world is difficult. And, you know, you almost need to take a bit of a ruthless approach to it where you, where there, there needs to be major reforms uh, to both, you know, the NCC, 
and the interaction between the municipality and, and the and 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 the federal government. There are a couple of models out there. Washington Washington DC is one of them, you know, that the downtown of Washington is is a federal district. Um, and the federal government is responsible for it. And they elect people or appoint people to run it. That's an option. Would it be the one that I pick? Probably not. But there are, what it's going to take is a is a concerted effort at reform. Uh, and I and I don't think that and this is, you know, this is why um, you know, my frustration bubbles up and I, and I, and I look to other avenues, obviously that one, one that you alluded to at the beginning, Paul, to try and push for this kind of reform. So how many people are out there like that, 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 you know, deal with it every single day, everybody, every single person that you see stuck in traffic in Orleans trying to make it downtown every day. I think, no, I think intuits that, that there's, that there's a problem, uh, that we really need to work on. You know, we're not a city, um, of 250,000 people anymore. This is this is a this is a million plus city, and a lot of that growth is happening uh, in the East End, and we're just mm. not seeing the kind of investment at <clears throat> either at either level um, that we need. And how when's what's the uh, timeline on the completion of the LRT to trim? Yeah, I mean, so you, you're seeing tr- tracks tracks are almost done now. Mm-hmm. They're they're putting up the cantonary system. You know, I, I, I think testing, testing begins, begins next year. Yeah, Paul says on, on track at odd time. <laughs> we are in the East end, in the East end, we're quite lucky that yeah. our, our extension will be done before, before the West, but uh, you know, things, there should be testing going on soon. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about that guys. I mean, like, sure. listen, like the timeline I'm, I'm, I'm pretty clear on. And the fact that it's, it's a pretty straight shot from the East, yeah. so it's not that sort of complication that we have at, at Herdman and Tremblay, nor is there a massive tunnel. Um, yeah. It's just straight. Yeah. So I don't have the same sort of, you know, same sort of worry as I would, uh, you know, in the cut and cover areas and, and whatnot. Uh, plus the contractors have been, you know, frustrating at times, but at least competent to, to work with. Right. Is that East end length that you're saying that testing is likely to start sooner rather than later? Is that, is the plan for that? If it's finished before the West of opening up that East end leg? Yes, like yeah. as soon as it's ready, testing is done, done properly, unlike the last time, and and ready to go, that they will open that up. Yeah, I can I can guarantee you there won't be the same sort of political you know pressure or bureaucratic pressure to to get that open this time around. I, I just I just don't see it happening. You know, following you know just Sorgan's report and you know the lessons learned from stage one, I don't think you're going to see that sort of rush. I think that they're going to they're going to get it right. But yes, right. because there's no interaction with the with the, with the Western the West. portion, you can kind mm-hmm. of open that up and, you know, we're, we're in good shape there. So yes, we will be, we will be earlier than the rest, you know, which is good because, you know, I find that sometimes there's a bit of a lag when it comes to policy, right? Like, I think, I think that, you know, we, w- I, in best case scenario, we've got new homes, density close to the transit way station when it opens. But like, you, I know that, that that's it's sticky, right? Like mm-hmm. I think people want to see that it's that it's that things are are moving, and there are a lot of things that are kind of standing in, in the way. You know, like the fact that it, it costs more today to per unit to build than it ever has, right? And we can we can talk about that if you want. Well, I I want to go back to Greg's question because you know we obviously have known you for a long time. We know what your intentions are, and obviously you're you're you know a kind hearted person. It's actually looking out for the general public. The perception, at least from the outside, from from a federal level, and tell me, I mean, it seems like it's a bit different on the municipal level, but federally, it seems like everyone is just kind of a talking piece. Like nobody actually seems to really care about fixing the problems. It seems like they want to keep their jobs. They want to keep, you know, keep things on the table that they have to fix so that, you Mm. know, they stay employed and nothing changes. For us as like the general public who want to see change, and know that change is needed. Like, what can we do to accelerate that? And how can we hold our MPs and or counselors like yourself? Like, how can we hold you more accountable? Yeah, that's a really good, that's a, that's a really good question. <laughs> I mean, you know, change is difficult and not everyone agrees with what kind of change is needed, which complicates mm-hmm. things even further. Like the the four of us on this call may, you know, we we probably look at the world 
in a very similar way. And there are people out there that think the complete opposite of us that, you know, might believe that, you know, people can't be trusted to make, to make their own decisions that a large government is needed, you know, to coerce people into making the decisions that, you know, they wish that people would make, you know, I, I'm the exact opposite of that. I think that the, you know, the, the most power should be devolved to the, to the lowest form of government, which would be the individual, right? People need to, I, I, I truly believe that people should be trusted to make their own decisions. And on aggregate, we move in the right direction. Um, so, you know, talking like, you know, people used to say, you know, for polite dinner conversation, avoid uh, what politics, sex, and religion don't avoid politics, you know, talk to people. I mean, like my views on things have changed even over the last five years, over the last 10 years, especially because of those conversations. And, you know, either your arguments get sharper because you're able to, you know, to express yourself and to think through why you believe what you believe, or you start to challenge yourself a little bit. You say like, well, you know, you know, you're either your argument gets exposed as being weak because of a conversation with somebody else, or as it's coming out of your mouth, you go, do I, do I believe that anymore? Like the evidence that I've seen over the course of the last little bit doesn't really bear that out. And so you begin to challenge yourself a little bit. And that's something that I did, you know, during the pandemic, you know, you know, no, no 30 hours a week of attending events. So like, what, what are you going to do with yourself to, to, to maintain, you know, productivity, you know, you spend two hours or three hours answering the emails that came in from the day before or the night before. And then you start, you know, I, I did things like this, like where I, you know, did a podcast where I brought city officials on and, and talked to them about plans and tried to keep people informed. But then you get to a point where you go, okay, well, you know, I've got this time. What am I going to do with it? And I just read and, and, and read things that I thought that, you know, that would challenge my beliefs and they evolve over time. And that's what we need to do. We need to talk about these issues, talk about them openly and not just like, you know, get a thousand people to send a form letter to a, to a, to your member of parliament or whatever, like that, like that doesn't do anything. Right. Especially if it's coming from a, you know, grassroots organization, especially because oftentimes it's not, you know, it's like AstroTurf, not really grassroots. And so, you know, what's the best way to do this? You know, get informed on, on the issues, build your own opinion of it and engage people in conversation like we're doing now, right? Like chat with your neighbors, chat with your friends, chat with your family. Maybe some of them are more knowledgeable in other areas than you. So you learn, they learn. And, and, and I think what I bemoan the most is kind of the retreat from that, from that public sphere, you know, in the 1960s, you know, people were very interested in, in, in politics and, and what's going on. 1970s too, 1980s, it starts to drop off a little bit. That decline continues through the nineties and, you know, into the two thousands and you, you know, I think that people either feel disengaged from the process and so they, you know, they don't, they don't try. Well, the, the only, like, I'll tell you a secret. The only way to feel less disengaged is to get engaged. Like it's not on like, you know, I go out and knock on doors. A lot of politicians go out and knock on doors, but like, don't wait for that. Don't wait for someone to come and like, you know, show you some sign or, you know, bring you, you know, an olive branch and say, you know, please, like, please come and tell me your opinion. It's like, no, get out there, get involved. Yeah, totally in the community. Right. Like when we were kids, our like politics or something that were maybe talked about at, you know, adult parties, our parents would be chatting or whatever, but like nobody really cared. Like if your friend or family member was a conservative or liberal, like nobody actually cared. <laughs> I think over COVID again, because of everything that, that we saw, it was very divisive. Like everyone was kind of set in their ways. Nobody was having those conversations. And if they were, they already had their opinion made and they were approaching it with visceral. Like they weren't actually having an open mind. It was like, this is my opinion and you're an idiot if you don't agree with me. And I think that's kind of continued, maybe maybe more mildly or, or more secretively, but I think people are still very like, you know, heels in the ground, as, as you said, kind of with NCC, but I think people are very stuck in their ways too. And like the most dangerous thing is someone who doesn't, who has a closed mind, right? Because they're not open to change, they're not open to other ideas. And I think that, you know, we're seeing that internationally as well, that people are very like, you're wrong, I'm right. And it's black and white and nothing is black and white as we've seen. There's no humility just, either. Like there's no humility. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I, I will freely admit, you know, if I've been wrong, 
or if I'm in the middle of a conversation, somebody makes a really good point and it's like, you know, I really hadn't looked at it that way. Mm -hmm. Like that really makes a lot of sense. And like your opinion on something evolves a little bit. Right. And, and we also rush to judgment, you know, mm -hmm. like somebody says, oh, you're a liberal or you're a conservative or you're a socialist or a social Democrat or whatever flavor they want to be that month. See, now I'm doing it and being facetious, but uh, you know, <laughs> people write people off based on, you know, their outward, uh, you know, what, however they manifest themselves politically. I don't, I don't think that that's fair. Mm -hmm. I think that there are several shades, you know, of, of, of belief and, and, and several, several shades of ideology. Just don't outsource your brain to an ideology. You know, it's fine that if, if you subscribe to some ideas, but challenge them from time to time and engage in a conversation with someone that you don't agree with. That's the best thing that you can do, mm -hmm. you know, like strike up a conversation with somebody you've never met. I think Bourdain used to say that, right. You know, and also get the cream sauce. You should do that too. But I mean, like mm -hmm. strike, strike, strike up a conversation with somebody you think you never would ever talk to. And I guarantee you, you're going to learn something. Mm -hmm. And have a lot in common. Yes. Mm -hmm. Way more, more in, in common, common than you yeah, think. Yeah, common. absolutely. <clears throat> Yeah, that's I think, great. I think that's what a lot of people forget is that you have more in common than you actually think <clears throat> and and kind of dismiss kind of on that surface level of what somebody's, you know, to your point, ideology or, or thought around something. And they kind of dismiss everything and anything that they, comes out of their mouth as opposed to engage in that conversation where they realize that, oh, yeah, you know what? Surface level, this topic, we don't agree, like we don't agree on and let's figure out why and, and kind of challenge each other. But then realizing that, you know, there is that deep down such similarities and people have, I think to Paul's point, I think over the last few years have that's gone to the wayside and people have forgotten about that and need to get back to that. And I think kind of, it goes back to, you know, some of the topics like we were talking about NTC and stuff like that, where they're willing to have that conversation about change and what's needed and not having that egotistical uh, viewpoint. And I think that's where a lot of it comes down to. So we, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess on that front kind of to, to, rope it into the the federal level you know i know that that you know recently you made it public and kind of and to your point of even changing you know your your headspace i mean you i've i've known you for i was thinking about it this morning it's kind of crazy man i've known each other since we were nine years old so since grade four so 30 years now but all grow, you know growing up you're you know young liberals and and in the liberal party and and kind of that but but recently you clearly done some change and and they get in and recently came out as running for the orleans seat on the federal level for the conservative party so obviously kind of taking exactly what you just said to to heart of, of just more so challenging yourself on different viewpoints how do you see and i know this isn't you know we're kind of on the topic of of on the local level but on the federal when we're talking about ncc and and how the federal level can can influence that or or help that change how do you foresee that you know, for where your role possibly could be if if things work out of of moving to that federal level. Yeah, I mean, you're right to point that out. And I did I did work, you know, in a previous life for for liberal members of parliament and and for for ministers. You know, I, I don't think anybody can argue that the you know current iteration of the Liberal Party is that fiscally responsible party of Jean Chrétien or Paul Martin anymore. Uh, it's not. And so, you know, for me. You know, I, I feel like I did not leave the Liberal Party, that the Liberal Party left me. And so, th you know, through that investigation uh, of myself, you know, I found myself very defensive of the rights to free speech. I think that it is important that people can speak their mind. Now, you have to bear the consequences of speaking your mind as well. So with, with every right comes an equally important responsibility. Uh, but I don't think people should be punished for what they believe or what they think, right? And so, you know, I worked on this as a as the chair of the Ottawa Public Library, and we brought in, you know, the most permissive and liberal and small in the small L sense intellectual freedom policy. So we don't like you know ban books or or burn books, right? People, should, if it's out there, it should be in the library and and readily available to people, so you can do the work that we've been talking about. And so once you, you get a little deeper into that and it's like, okay, so, you know, what, that's great. Free speech is important. What gives me free speech? And it's like, okay, well, well, what gives me free speech is that, you know, I'm an, I'm an individual and I have a right to express myself. Okay. Well, what makes you an individual? Well, nobody owns me. Like I'm, I'm my own property. Okay. And then, so what, 
provides you with that. And I believe that it is the right to, to the right to it's private property rights. Like you are your own person, you own yourself, you own your property and your voice and your brain is your property. And so that's, I think that that fundamental respect for private property is, is, is paramount and it needs to be almost above all else. And then, so when I look at, you know, the political landscape in Canada, um, I think we've, I think we've demonstrated that the two other parties don't care much for private property rights. So, you know, what are you, what are you left with and, and what, what does that vision look like? And, you know, that's you know, what, what I was attracted to is that, um, is that, is that respect for the individual, uh, while compassionately, uh, caring, uh, for everyone and providing everyone with an equal opportunity. That's important because, you know, a lot of the problems that we face in society today are taken care of when you respect each and every person as an individual, regardless of what they believe, regardless of, you know, where they come from, regardless of, you know, who they decide to take home with them, regardless of their family makeup. These are individuals. These are people just like you, and we should respect each other. So, you know, where does this go? You know, I, I obviously I hope to be successful. It would be an honor. I, I love, love Orleans. You know, I'm looking to start to alleviate some of the issues that we've been discussing today, among others, things like affordability, start getting rid of some of those inputs that are making housing cost more, you know, you have to reduce the cost to build to reduce the cost of homes. Like it's the inputs and it's the compounding of the inputs, right? The province tried to do this, um, but staff at the municipal level, bring a report forward. You know, there are fast timelines for site plan review and OP amendment that were imposed by the province. Um, but now new applications aren't deemed complete until staff are satisfied with the submission. So you don't even, the clock doesn't even start until staff say, okay, your submission is complete. Which I, I don't think is entirely fair. You know, staff need to be able to work with the applicant back and forth in good faith over the course of 90 days or 30 days to get the job done, but forcing everything to be done up front, like you need this study and this study and this study and this study. Half the time, the study has already been done at an adjacent property. You know, do you need a slope stability study for like do two neighbors both need to go out and pay a hundred thousand dollars for a slope stability study when they are right beside each other? Like there needs to be some, some common sense injected back into this process, right? Pre-consultations are taking longer. Parkland dedication is now 10%, regardless of the proximity to green space. That's unhelpful. You're not going to be able to build as many units. If you're right beside a park, you have to build 10% of your property as a park. Like that just doesn't make sense. If, even if you're right across from a park, like, do you think that any of the abutting properties near millennium really need 10% of that space to be used as parkland? No, if you want to build more units, that's not a helpful policy. You know, stage two LRT that we were talking about. They bermed up all of the uh, clover leaf intersections, right? That's going to cost so much money to remove if you want to build housing close to the stations. You can rejig those intersections. Instead of wasting nine hectares of land on these giant clover leaf intersections, you can rejig them to look like Parkdale. Now you free up all the city land and you're literally within walking distance of a train station. Yeah, that one in term um, is absurd. The wrap ridiculous. Is like, yeah. Ridiculous. It's so yeah. ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, There's we've seen... We've seen builders walk away. Like there's been projects in Ottawa that specifically and, and in Ontario specifically that builders are actually walking away and saying, you know, we're not going to get involved right now because the cost to build is like, it doesn't make sense. There's no, there's no profitability there for the builder. There's no incentive to build. Right. And it's not even about profitability for the builder. Like people don't understand this, right? I hate the narrative around development. And it's like, you know, unless you're some sort of pioneer and you're going to build your own home, like guess who built your home, right? Mm -hmm. It's a developer, somebody who took all the risk, by the way, on submitting, you know, a subdivision, somebody take all the financial risk. And so, yes, of course, if you're going to take a lot of risk, you should reap, you know, the, the equal reward to that. But a lot of the times, like these people are not rolling in money because they have to leverage the previous project and the success of the previous project for the next project. Mm -hmm. So it all gets rolled up. So it's not like people are, you know, it's not like, you know the owners of, of uniform or, or whatever, or Scrooge McDuck, you know what I mean? Like rolling around in money in a giant vault. It's like, no, they take this massive risk to build 
to buy land. Yeah, exactly. Oh. With the coins coming out of the mouth. Right? <laughs> and you know, and and they and they do this work and they go through they go through this and they provide homes for people. And the only way to make homes, there are several things we can do to make homes cheaper, but having more stock is one of them. And you know, put bringing in policies like like the high efficiency development standard, which isn't necessarily helpful at all at this time. It's adding thousands of dollars to each unit. Inclusionary zoning, which doesn't make sense at all, uh, because essentially you've got one person subsidizing their neighbor, uh, and they both make the same amount of money. The parkland dedication that we talked about means less, less, less units. Extending timelines through a longer pre-consultation because time is money, and 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 what's with high inflation right now, inflation is eating in to how much your money is actually worth because of profligate government spending because of disruptions to to supply chains during the pandemic is it all the federal government's fault no did they make it worse and amplify it absolutely you know punitive changes to brownfield cip now if you want to if you want to redevelop a brownfield you'll only get this is what's proposed you'll only get the brownfield grant which is smaller than it used to be only if you're building affordable housing only like this Yes, we need to build affordable housing, 100%. But I mean, like some brownfields would be a great spot for mixed-use development yeah. and other things. And you, like you said, you know what makes a f housing affordable is having more houses available. Yes. If you yes. Buy. <laughs> yes. That's what makes houses more affordable. Yes, and they made punitive changes to the, to the CIP as well. And so now, you know, like if you're in an industrial area, right, and you want to take an old brownfield and you want to build something else and, you know, you you... It's, it costs a lot to remediate a brownfield. You're not going to be, because it's zoned industrial, not going to be able to take advantage of that. Now they're saying you can stack them. So if you, if you meet certain criteria, you'll be able to stack them. But I, I just, I don't think that this is, this is going to be helpful. What we need to do is, is build more homes to reduce the cost of housing because it's, it's a, you know, a supply and demand issue. You guys, you guys talk about this all the time. <laughs> Uh, and all the time and you collect and <laughs> yes. you collect more property taxes, especially mm -hmm. on infill, mm -hmm. like especially on infill. So if you build more homes, you collect more property taxes. Now there's a cost of servicing. So, you know, growth to the urban boundary doesn't, you know, it's, it's a bit of a wash and in fact, maybe a bit of a detriment, but no one argues that we, that we, you know, we, that we don't need to expand at least a little bit, but when it comes to infill development, that's like, you want to incentivize that, right? Mm -hmm. Like in the downtown core, you know, in along transit corridors, you want to incentivize that. Uh, and the city always, the city will always do better by incentivizing that because the, you will collect more property tax. Yeah, I like think it would be amazing to get to a point where we are happy to pay our taxes because we know the money is going to the right yeah. places that are helping the right people. There's a saying, you know, uh, a rising tide lifts all ships. Like, Yes. That should be the sole goal of the government is to properly spend our money. It feels like right now we have this financial planner and accountant that are working against us and we're just feeding the money to manage for on our behalf. And it's just being mismanaged, thrown away, siphoned. Like it's very frustrating. My, my youngest son, who's 12, I was explaining taxes to him not long ago as I was talking about on the show. And he said he wants to become an accountant so that he can properly manage Canadians' money and spend it in the it. right mm. places. <laughs> said, it. Exactly what we need 12-year-olds thinking these days. <laughs> no, well I love it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so important, right? Like, it's, it's, it's so important that we reduce barriers to growth. I mean, like, if you want to build affordable housing, you know, what we should really be doing yes incentivize incentivize private private developers to do it make it feasible for them you know make it do it you know that old that old story that dave that we heard when you know when, when we were kids about you know the sun and the wind make a bet to see if they can get this guy to take his coat off and the wind blows and blows and blows as hard as it can and the guy just holds his coat tighter and tighter and tighter and all the sun has to do is come out and smile and shine on the guy and he takes his jacket off right i mean you have to work with and, and incentivize and make things easy for people to build more homes and not just, you know, ram, ram unhelpful policies down their throat. It, there's, there's loads of city land uh, right now, unused city land. Why not partner up? Like do, do a, you know, do a proper process, but partner up with, with, with great uh, not-for-profit developers like multi-faith housing initiative 
uh, and others and get them to put together a plan, you know, a rough sketch, something that's not going to cost them a bazillion dollars. What would you do with this if we were to give it to you? And then, and then pick, pick the best one and hand the, hand the land over for a dollar. That's a huge input cost, you know, and then also forgive some of the processing charges and fees as well. Mm -hmm. And then you get that affordable housing. Yeah. Now some of those are going to be, you know, CMHC market rent, and some of them may be able to be deeply affordable housing. Maybe a group of people come together, maybe OCH and, and, you know, maybe Veterans House Canada, along with the multi-faith housing initiative, maybe they all, you know, they, maybe they work together even better on a proposal, but there's no reason why, you know, corporate real estate should be trying to charge the max amount of possible, max amount possible for a piece of land that's going to be used for something like affordable housing. There are lots of things that we can do to make it easier. And these are the things that, that I, that I push for with staff every, every single day. But this is another example of how like our policies and our stated goals work against each other. That's awesome. So work, <clears throat> constant work in progress. I'm sorry if I'm being this, like, like you're probably it's like, people are like I think we all, I think we all love listening to you. Yeah. It's I great. think, I think the three of us, and I'm sure the people listening as well, really appreciate the, the honesty and candor, you know, and sincerity that you, that you have, you know, you're not the typical politician or bureaucrat that kind of just gives the, the positive answer or kind of scripted answer, if you will, willing to, to challenge your own colleagues on a daily and then even philosophically as well. So I think it's a breath of fresh air. I know for at least us three, I would imagine. <laughs> Matt and, is the I mean, sun. He's the, you're the sun, not the wind. I know? try to be, I try to be. <laughs> and I get it. Like not everyone's going to like me and not everyone's going to agree with me, but it's like, you know, so what, you know, like, I, like be honest, just be honest about how you feel about things. And if somebody challenges you and they've got a good argument, maybe my opinion changes, right? I'm open. I'm open to, to hearing other people. I think more people should be open to hearing other people. Mm -hmm. and, Imagine no, that from a politician. Strange. Very refreshing. Strange. <laughs> An open mind. Wow. So so what's what's next for you, man? After after this, where where are you going next? Like are you then are you a mayor? Are you gonna be a mayor? Oh, That's I don't know. My like I've got a, a two year old and a four year old, right? And so <laughs> you know, going yeah. to going to a bake bake sales in, in carp on the weekend and and, and bouncing around all over the place would be, would be very difficult. You know, I'm young uh, and I have the, and I have the energy now, you know, the, one of the biggest, you know, one of the biggest frustrations is you, you got to try to find that sweet spot, right? If you're, if you get lots of, lots of energy when you're really young, but not, you know, not the mind for it or not the, you know, not the experience for it. And then when you get too long in the tooth, like some politicians, I think that we can probably think of one in particular that, you know, sticks around too long. You don't have the energy, even though you have all the experience. So I'm, you, know, you try to find that, that sort of sweet spot. Look, I, I just want to do the best that I can for, for Orleans and, and, and for Canada. I'm, I always keep an open mind as to, as to what can be next, but there, there are, there's also some, there's also some constants in my life. Like I'm, I'm vicious with my family time. My family mm. means, means the world to me. And I want to spend as much time as I can with my daughters. I want to be there at night to put them to bed. I want to do story time. I want to do bath time. You know, that's, that's super, super important to me. And there's like a class of politician that like, that wasn't important to them or they were old enough that their kids had grown up so they can yeah. go and do stuff. Like I can't be everywhere all the time. And so you, you, there's a trade off there, right? Like if you want someone who's going through the same experience as you trying to raise a, a kid and work and, you know, getting told that daycare is closed today. So I have to stay home. Uh, with my with my daughter and try and pump out you know a couple hours of work and try to do phone calls and Zoom meetings while my daughter's running around, uh, or do you want someone that has no idea what that's like, you know, or somebody who's not facing those kind of sort of financial mm -hmm. pressures, right? No, you want someone who knows what you're going through. As far as mm -hmm. I'm concerned, anyway, that's my argument. But I mean, I'll always you know I'll always be playing music, you know, try, trying to revive my Veteran X podcast because mental health is more important than other po uh, ever post post pandemic. And you know, yeah, like Dave and. Dave and Paul mentioned, you know, I'm going to take a run. I'm going to take a run to the federal seat here because a lot of the problems that I feel like, you know, the frustrations that I feel, and don't get me wrong, the city, the city bears responsibility and, and us as a council bear responsibility for some of the frustrations that people are feeling in the East End. And I do my best to, to try and alleviate those as well. Uh, but I think that there are a couple of roadblocks that would allow the city to be able to get, get through some of these big issues by having some, you know, some different leadership I, I will not speak ill of of anyone at all but it may be a different perspective um, you nailed it man 
federal level. You know, I don't want to speak ill of anybody at all. I think that everybody really does try their best. I feel like Ooh. people come into politics with a, with of a course, I agree and with try, that. And dude. they try their best. Yeah. Things Move change. 2044. <laughs> First announced here. <laughs> once the girls, once the girls are what? old enough. To do what? Uh, oh. That's awesome. Thank you so oh, much, Matt, wow. for, for joining yeah. us, for, for sharing your insights, your time, everything. I know your, your schedule is very busy, especially with the, with the young ones. So thank you so much for, for joining us, for, for sharing your insights. And we'll definitely have you back in a year. <laughs> no, no. We, we should have you back maybe every should be, the match months. should be on every quarter just every for like a, an update it doesn't need to be an extended show like this amazing episode but just yeah. like a little quarterly update like the luloff like 15 with luloff, luloff report we're totally joe rogan <laughs> the luloff luloff report. Report. yeah we're, we're totally joe roganing this one eh we're, we're just <laughs> going into the night right. now yeah i think a lot of people are going to find <laughs> some Good value in this. That's oh, for sure. I think that there'll be a lot of people from like the you know opposition research bureau that'll take tidbits. <laughs> well, those. I'll tell you Some what. Sound there'll bites. Be, there'll be reels all over the place, but yeah, Matt said this. Matt said yeah. this. Yeah, we'll grab only the nastiest sound bites. Eh? <laughs> Please do. Yeah, just the gritty ones. Just the gritty. Ones. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in. This will be released Tuesday morning. Uh, every Tuesday, 10 a.m. We got a new episode for you, and uh, yeah, we're gonna title this one the Luloff Report. Yeah, amazing. Uh, check us out on socials. As we said, we got uh, shorts coming out now on, on Instagram and TikTok and so on. So make sure to follow us on all our socials. Check out the videos. And uh, thanks as always for tuning in. Gentlemen, do we have time for some mood boost quickly? Absolutely. Can I squeeze these in. All right, I got three. First one, number one. Sorry, sir. We don't serve time travelers here. Time traveler walks into a bar. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Number two, I found stir fry in my bed this morning. I must have been sleepwalking again. <laughs> oh, oh, God. Oh, I'm LOLing here, Paul. I'm LOLing. And, uh, and last but not least, the internet connection at my farm was really poor. So I moved the modem to the barn. Now I have stable Wi Fi. Oh, oh, yes. Well done. Well done. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now we're done. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> And special thanks to those that stuck around for the uh, the movie. <laughs> See you next week, everyone. <laughs> thanks again, Matt. Take care, guys. See you. Later. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please remember to like, share, comment, and subscribe, because we'd really like that.